Good afternoon. Welcome to the fourth part of Holland and Knight's 2023 New York Real Estate Trends webinar series. I'm Stuart Saft, a partner at Holland Tonight and the New York Real Estate Practice Group leader. This is the third year in which we have been presenting these webinars on New York real estate. In 2021, we did two webinars on the Florida condominium disaster and whether New York City buildings could collapse, and if so, what could be done to avoid it, which resulted in increased garage inspections. In 2022, immediately after Russia invaded Ukraine and the federal government imposed sanctions, we did two webinars on the impact of the sanctions on New York real estate. Earlier this year, we did webinars entitled Adaptive Reuse, Converting Office Buildings to Residential Use, Converting Rental Apartment Buildings to Condominiums, and Creating Value, Distressed Condominiums and Commercial Property. All of the prior webinars and this one are available for viewing on the Holland Tonight website. Today's webinar is on leasehold condominiums, which enable nonprofits to obtain tax exemptions on what is essentially leased property that makes the space more affordable to the nonprofit and more leasable to the commercial owners. Joining me today are Robert Pollack and Glenn Boren of Marcus and Pollack, and my partners at Holland tonight, Renee Kovit and Aaron Goodman. We will explain the basics of leasehold condominiums, how they are structured and formed, the process at the Department of Finance, rulings we have obtained, and the role of the Attorney General in approving nonprofit sale of property and reviewing leasehold condominiums. We will then take Q&A. CLE credit will be available for this session, and you will be advised on how to obtain it during the presentation. I want to thank my law firm, Alan Tonight, and Joe Gay, the real estate section leader, and Mike Haig, Lauren Faulkner, Kayla Thompson, and Min View for their assistance in putting on these webinars. Let me tee up the presentation by noting that we did our first leasehold condominium in 2009, the second one done after the Cornell ruling, and have done dozens since in every shape and size on properties in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx, Nassau, and Suffolk counties. It is a complex structure that can be very flexible to the needs of the nonprofit and the property owner. It is my pleasure to introduce my partner, Renee Kovit. Thank you, Stuart. Hi, everybody. As Stuart mentioned, the leasehold condominium structure is a popular way for landlords and nonprofits to modify their relationship to permit space that a nonprofit would formerly lease to qualify for real property tax exemption. Unlike other states in New York, nonprofits that lease space rather than own properties do not qualify for a tax exemption, since actually owning property is a precondition to New York State's tax exemption. The tax exemption in New York is based on the Department of Finance letter, private letter rulings issued on February 13, 2009 and October 15, 2019, which provides the following requirements for a not-for-profit organization acquiring property to qualify for a real estate tax exemption. The first is that the leasehold condo must be exclusively devoted to non-residential purposes. The second is that the underlying leasehold interest in the land must have a remaining term of 30 years or more upon acquisition of the unit. The third is that the unit owner must be required under the lease to pay both land and building taxes assessed on the unit. And the last is that the not-for-profit must satisfy all of the ownership and use criteria set forth in RPTL Section 420A. Section 420A provides a tax exemption from real estate taxes for nonprofit organizations that are organized for the following purposes, religious, charitable, hospital, or educational purposes, or for the mental and moral support of men, women, and children that quote, own property in New York. 
DOF's ruling recognized that the ownership of a unit in a leasehold condo is the ownership of property, even though ownership is based on a lease. In addition, the 2019 private letter ruling also held that if a leasehold condo has another section of the building that is for profit, the nonprofit section of the building is still eligible for the real estate tax exemption. The difference between a fee condominium and a leasehold condominium is that in a fee condominium, the common elements include the land. In a leasehold condo, the, condom, the common elements only include the leasehold interest in the land. As mentioned before, the nonprofit can take an entire building or just a portion of the building and still obtain a tax exemption for the portions of the building that the nonprofit is utilizing. It should be noted that the structuring documents would need to be drafted differently, depending on whether the nonprofit is taking the whole building or just a portion of the building. As Stuart mentioned, we, we have done many different variations of, of space that the nonprofit is taking. And depending on you know, how much space they're taking or what they're taking, the documents would, would change. But the basic structure of forming a leasehold condo includes the following. The fee owner or an affiliate of the fee owner based on the structure and the nonprofit enter into a ground lease for all or part of the building. The ground lease must be for more than 30 years from the condominium's formation and the lessee must be required to pay the real estate taxes to New York City. The fee owner or the affiliate of the fee owner and the nonprofit enter into a purchase and sale agreement to sell one or more of the leasehold condominium units to the nonprofit. And then whichever entity that is forming the leasehold condo applies to the New York State Attorney General's office for a no action letter permitting the formation of the leasehold condo. Once the condo is formed and the units are conveyed to the not-for-profit, the not-for-profit applies to the Department of Finance for the real estate tax exemption. And Aaron will talk more about that process. And as, I, as Stuart mentioned earlier, there's also a structure called a condo within a condo where we worked with the Department of Finance to, to form those regulations. And that's, that's in an instance where the building is already a condominium and we would like to form a leasehold condominium within it. Um, as Stuart mentioned, we've worked on many of these deals and about 30 in the last four years, 20 which have already closed. Some of these deals included a university that took 10 floors from a Midtown office building, a medical center that took 500,000 square feet from a Midtown office building, a medical center that took 400,000 square feet from a portion of a mall on Long Island, two additional medical centers that took buildings in Nassau County and Suffolk County, an entire office building in Midtown East, two office buildings next to each other on Lower Fifth Avenue, an entire office building downtown, and various charter schools and also homeless shelters, which Aaron will discuss with you next. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce my partner, Aaron Goodman. Well, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. As Stuart and Renee have been discussing, we use the leasehold condo structure to help not-for-profits save money by becoming exempt from paying real estate taxes. And I want to talk about some specific ways that we help not-for-profits, and then I'll get into some detail, like Renee said, about the 428 tax exemption itself. And then I will turn it over to Bob and Glenn to get into more detail about the real estate tax piece of all this. So the first thing I want to talk about is the sale of real estate. When a not-for-profit or religious organization wants to sell its property, it's required by New York State law to get approval from the New York State Attorney General's office and in certain complicated matters, they also need to get approval from the New York State Supreme Court. And many not-for-profit companies, especially religious organizations, own valuable real estate and are looking to bring needed money into their organizations, which they can get by selling their property. But in order to do this, we work with the not-for-profit to prepare a voluminous petition to the Attorney General's office and sometimes also the Supreme Court explaining how the not-for-profit meets the two-pronged test that it is required to meet by New York State not-for-profit corporation law. The test is that one, the consideration and the terms of the transaction to sell the, the property must be fair and reasonable to the corporation. And two, the purposes of the corporation or the interests of its members will be promoted by the transaction. So to accomplish this, the AG's office needs to review 
among many other documents, a current appraisal of the property, and they need to understand exactly how the proceeds of the sale will be used. The AG's office also needs to see that the board of directors of the not-for-profit approved the sale, and if there are members that have voting rights, the membership must also approve the sale. And what sometimes has complicated this is that if members vote against the transaction, that needs to be disclosed as well. And this can create a, a back and forth between the AG's office, the, the not-for-profit or religious organization's board and the dissenting members. Uh, and that can go on for, for months, but it's it's worth it for the, the organization because they can make, make a lot of money selling their property in the city. The problem with that, and we get back into the leasehold condo world is that then they lose their real estate tax exemption that, that basically automatically comes with owning property. Um, as an eligible not-for-profit or religious organization. So when the not-for-profit now sells its property and instead is renting space, we need to utilize the leasehold condo structure to get the real estate tax exemption for the not-for-profit. And as Renee and Stuart have been saying over the past few years, we've worked with more and more tenants and landlords to create leasehold condos to allow the tenants to apply for the 420A real estate tax exemption. And specifically, as Renee was saying, over the past two or three years, we started re receiving more and more requests from homeless shelter operators wanting to obtain the 420A real estate tax exemption. We also have been contacted by many landlords um, who have tenants who operate homeless shelters where the landlord wants to structure the transaction to enable their tenant to obtain the, the real estate tax exemption because it's really beneficial to both parties. So since the not-for-profit operators often don't own their real, real estate, we need to use the leasehold condo structure. Um, the problem was that New York City Department of Finance was taking the position that homeless shelters are not eligible to use the leasehold condo structure. In most areas of the city, leasehold condos are only allowed for non-residential use. They're not permitted if the premises is used for residential use. And Department of Finance was saying that homeless shelters or residential use. And then the New York State Attorney General's office was following Department of Finance's lead and they wouldn't process our no action, no action applications for homeless shelters. So we completely disagreed with the Department of Finance's characterization of a homeless shelter as residential use. Under the New York City zoning resolution, a homeless shelter is characterized as community facility. And we firmly believe that the Department of Finance should rely on the zoning resolution when determining whether a use is residential or not because the, the zoning resolution is used by the Department of Buildings in approving development in the city if the Department of Finance could create its own definition of what was residential and non-residential, developers wouldn't know if their proposed uses were permitted until they were reviewed by Department of Finance. So it would mean that dorms and staff housing at hospitals and maybe even hospitals themselves would not be built because the developers wouldn't have a clear understanding of whether they would qualify for the tax exemption. So we decided that we should submit a ruling request to the Department of Finance explaining our position and requesting that the city rule that homeless shelters are non-residential in accordance with the zoning resolution and are eligible for the tax exemption using the leasehold condo structure. And we waited the entire three months that the city was allowed to take and they ruled on the last day in our favor, agreeing with our position and approving the leasehold condo structure for homeless shelters. And they also, in that ruling, confirmed that the affiliate structure that Renee was talking about a little bit um, for creating these sold condos is acceptable to Department of Finance. So it was a, a huge uh, a huge win to get that ruling. Um, and now we've worked with many homeless shelter operators and landlords in negotiating creating leasehold condos. Um, so that brings me to the last thing I'll talk a little bit about, which is the 420A tax exemption itself. So the tax exemption, like Renee was saying, is based on Section 420A of the New York Real Property Tax Law. And the application is a relatively short check the box type of application that's submitted to Department of Finance. And the application is really meant for nonprofits who own their properties in the traditional sense of the word. And we have tenants who only sold condo units in various configurations, which can be complicated to explain in a check the box type of application. And the purpose of the application is to demonstrate um, to Department of Finance, what Renee was talking about before, that the real estate is owned by the eligible not-for-profit entity and that they use the property for the eligible not-for-profit purpose. In our deal, sometimes the not-for-profit doesn't even own a leasehold condo unit. Sometimes an LLC owns the leasehold condo unit and its sole member is a not-for-profit. Or in some cases, the LLC owns a, um, the leasehold condo unit and leases to a not-for-profit. And in those cases, we have to try and very carefully explain in the application what we're doing and that it's the, the properties are still eligible and there's special language that needs to go into the 
the operating documents to make sure that the properties remain eligible. <laughs> Basically, like Renee was saying, and Stuart was saying, no two deals are alike, and we have to consider how to fit our, you know, complex scenarios that we make sure we work through with the tenants and landlords. We have to fit that into a, a very simple application to Department of Finance. And the whole goal of creating a leasehold condo is, of course, to obtain the real estate tax exemption. And the tax exemption is retroactive to the date that the leasehold condo is created. And that means that taxes are being paid while the exemption is pending at Department of Finance and, and someone is therefore entitled to a refund of taxes. Um, and generally, the party that paid the taxes is eligible to receive the, the refund. But I'm going to turn this over to Bob and Glenn to get into more detail about the, the real estate tax piece of this. Thank you, Aaron. Um, for the longest time, it was the black letter law in New York City that, and New York that in order to qualify for a tax exemption, the tax exempt organization had to own and occupy and utilize the real property for its tax exempt purpose. And we had run across leasehold condominiums. It was, it was in connection with the typical situation where there's a fee owner and a long-term ground lease, or in some instances, for example, a Barry Park City Authority, some public authorities, uh, governmental entities where they allowed leasehold condos. Um, ironically, it was the city itself that opened up the door to this, this process. Uh, they were looking for, there was a tax exempt organization that said, look, we can't afford to buy real property, but, and the city wanted to help them out. And they said, let's be creative and what can we do? And they opened the door with their, their initial ruling, uh, allowing one particular um, charity uh, an exemption, even though it was on a leasehold condo. And from there it's grown. And uh, when it first happened, we thought, well, maybe it's just a one-off situation, but DOF uh, embraced it and they published the, the ruling and they started accepting them. Uh, it, it was a gradual process. They first uh, found that if you deviated in any way, shape or form from that format, uh, you weren't eligible. But as time has gone by, it's become uh, in, entrenched in New York City real estate. And for, for good reason, uh, real estate taxes are extraordinarily high. Um, the, the, a, a typical class A office building can, can have real estate taxes in more than $30 a square foot. And even a B plus building will, could be paying high $20 per square foot in real estate taxes. So there's an enormous incentive, particularly in this economic environment where landlords are, uh, are it's coming across an office tenant is uh, a, a scarcity and uh, to be coveted if you keep your office building occupied. Um, and of course, I'm, so with the economic interest in it are, you know, very much aligned for both the tax exempt organization and the landlord, as the city is the only one who doesn't collect any revenue uh, on this. And there's a, a good deal of revenue um, that is at, at issue. Um, I'll turn it over to our, our, our firm's managing attorney, Glenn Bourne, to pick it up from there. Hi, good afternoon. Um, talk a little bit more about how you get the exemption. So uh, Renee and Aaron and Stuart have gotten you to the point where you've made your deal and papered it and you've created your condominium or, or condo within a condo. Um, you've recorded your declaration. You were submitted for recording at with the city. You know, they skipped some of the steps here, but you know, they had to get the tax map office of the Department of Finance to sign off on the declaration and tax law drawings. Then you had a submit for recording with the city register, another part of finance, they record it. Once that happens, you're you're ready to go get your exemption. So what do you do next? First, a couple of things to do with those two parts of finance. One, with the um, tax map office, go back and look at the digital tax map online and make sure that the Tax map has been amended to show your new condo lot lots. If it's if it was a single lot before, now you should have multiple lots that are designated as condo lots. And there's a there's an indication on the map that it's now a condo. If you are amending an existing condo, you should see the new lots being added at the end of the list of lots. Uh, that should only take about a week to 10 days after the 
declaration is recorded. So if it doesn't happen, sometimes the expediter has to check and see what's why it got stuck in the pipe. The other thing to do once you have your deck recorded is to have the declarant, which is typically the nonprofit, especially in the condo with a condo situation, um, um, grant a confirmatory deed to itself and, and submit it for recording. Once you've done that, and by the way, that's not strictly necessary. Once the declaration is recorded, the the declarant owns the units and uh, satisfies the ownership requirement of the nonprofit exemption. But uh, having a deed is comforting to the Department of Finance. I guess the way to look at this is that other than the the structure, the special nature of the leasehold condo, the um, satisfying the ownership requirement, everything else about the nonprofit exemption for leasehold condo is the same as for any other kind of property, a standalone building or a fee condo unit that's owned and used by a nonprofit. So you've just used the leasehold condominium mechanism to satisfy ownership. And once you've done that, there's really nothing different about the process. Um, there's a couple of minor minor points, but really it's the same. But one thing is the Department of Finance is used to having a deed to, to uh, prove ownership. So even though it's not strictly needed, it's uh, a low cost item to uh, record a confirmatory deed. Once you, you've submitted that for recording, even if it hasn't shown up on record yet, if you have the cover sheet showing it was submitted, you can use that in your application for exemption. So one of the, I'll go through the requirements for, for a ex, nonprofit exemption again, in a little more detail. First, you have to have ownership. So we've satisfied that. Here's the only little wrinkle. As part of your application, you're gonna submit the, the lease, or probably a recorded memo of lease, uh, the condo declaration, uh, and in a, in a very concise cover letter explained to the Department of Finance commercial exemption unit where to find what they're looking for in these documents. They're really looking for the 30-year unexpired term as of the date of the recording of the declaration and the fact that the unit owner is required to pay the property taxes from the date the condo is formed. Um, theoretically, those things that should have already been satisfied by by uh, Holland and Knight or other competent condo council, by the attorney general and by the, the Department of Finance tax map office, otherwise the condo shouldn't exist. And the, now at this point it does exist, but nonetheless the exemption unit wants to check those boxes. So make them happy, give them that as part of the application. The rest of it, as I said, is not at all different if it were a, not a fee condo or a fee property in general, um, the nonprofit has to own it. It has to be a corporation or association operated not, not for profit and not as a guise for profit making. So what's a corporation is easy. That's usually formed under the New York not, not for profit, a corporation law or a similar law of another state or other statutes providing for incorporation of nonprofits for specific purposes. Uh, an LLC can co cover, uh, an LLC can also be a applicant under another letter ruling on the Department of Finance would said that a single purpose LLC can be considered a eligible nonprofit association. And the letter ruling is it actually two letter rulings, if you have three letter rulings, on, available from the Department of Finance that lists some additional things that the Department of Finance wants to see in the LLC papers that show, satisfy the Department of Finance that only the uh, single member nonprofit corporation will benefit from the activities of the LLC and that in the event of dissolution, all of its assets will revert to that nonprofit corporation. Uh, but if you if you check those boxes, an LLC can be the the owning entity. Um, 
the uh, nonprofit has to be formed for one of the enumerated purposes. And um, Renee listed those purposes in 420A, and they're up on the slide here. Uh, there's a there's a few uh, um, that come under a, a section 420B by local option. A few were excluded by local option. Bar our bar associations are not allowed to have the nonprofit exemption. We're discriminated against. Um, but the general idea is that if your organization qualifies under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code, it'll be considered a nonprofit for New York City tax exemption purposes. But that's not 100%. That's only about 98.5%. Um, you know, you have to see that it fits within one of these categories or more, one, or more than one of these categories. Um, and is not falling into one of the excluded categories, which are fairly obscure. But you know, it's and if it's not 501c3, but some other part of 501c, it, it may not be eligible. You have to look carefully at that. At those things like trade associations are not eligible. Um, uh, and then probably the most common issues in relate to the use requirement. The nonprofit has to use the property for its uh, charitable or other nonprofit purposes. Uh, if it's occupied office space as of the time of the application, that's fine. But often, we, of course, that's not the case. Often the space is raw space that has to be built out. There's a there's a exception in the statute provided for that called uh, the good faith contemplation of construction of suitable improvements, uh, and that requires some proof that um, there are concrete plans for making the space usable. Uh, there's funds available to make the space usable, and that the corporation has a definite intent to to carry out those improvements. Often in the these uh, office uh, space deals, a lot of the proof that you need will be in exhibits to the lease itself, where the landlord is building out the space for the tenant. Um, another uh, an exception to the use requirement is that sometimes the nonprofit does not need all the space itself or doesn't need any of it, but wants another organization to use the space. So the other organization could be an affiliate or an unrelated uh, organization, but that organization has to qualify as a nonprofit as if it were the owner, they have to meet all the requirements as to organization and purpose. Um, in addition, the lease between the unit owner nonprofit and the occupant lessee must uh, provide for rent that does not exceed the operating expenses, um, carrying costs, and depreci depreciation allocable to the space. What does that mean exactly? It means basically it's a space sharing arrangement, not a profit making arrangement for the owner of the unit. Um, so if that's the situation, uh, you're going to need to show the Department of Finance the lease. And also, it's recommended that you provide a little pro forma to show that you meet that, that test. And by the way, the rent could be greater than market rent or greater than the rent that the nonprofit is paying under its underlying lease, as long as those that specific formula is met. Um, there are... Um, there's some other use issues that are more, less common. One is where the nonprofit doesn't need to use the space at all for, because it's uh, planning to sell or move out. Um, doesn't result in immediate loss of the exemption. It, there's a reasonable period of non-use is acceptable. Long-term non-use, however, would may result in loss of the exemption. Um, and then there's you know partial use where. Uh, part of the space is leased out to a business 
Um, not typical in the leasehold condo situation, but it, again, everything that happens in the nonprofit exemption world does apply to leasehold condos. So if you have that situation, the Department of Finance is capable of uh, allocating the value of the space between the exempt portion and the non-exempt portion. And it typically does that by square footage. Um, we talked about nonprofits, but it's also worth noting. And if you we go to the next slide, you can see that there are also governments are potential uh, owners of lease and condo units and can uh, receive exemption under their the statutes for their particular form of government. Um, <clears throat> governments are different than nonprofits. Many of them don't have a use requirement. Some do, but others don't. Um, the application process is generally uh, minimal. It's really just a, a letter to the Department of Finance or an email. Um, the um, The ones that we've seen in, in existing leasehold condo deals are foreign governments and public authorities created under New York state law. Uh, we haven't, I haven't seen the state or the city proper enter into a, uh, or the US government enter into a non, a leasehold condo arrangement, but certainly there are uh, a number in the uh, public authorities and the foreign governments who have done that. Um, there are some uh, public authorities that are not required to own the property, which is uh, in their, their statutes, their authorizing statutes, it specifically says in some cases, for example, the MTA is one of them, that property that they own or control is exempt from taxation. So in that case, uh, no need for a leasehold condo. A fee condo will do. Theoretically, you don't even need a condo, but typically um, the Department of Finance wants the space separated for convenience. So you know, create a fee condo and just lease the space to the public authority that has that ability to uh, get exemption of lease space. Other entities like the uh, the state and the city and the United Nations have to actually own the space. Uh, but as I said, we haven't seen them do leasehold deals. Um, I think that uh, uh, the only other thing I want to talk about is the application process itself. As we said, it's a, there's a form. <laughs> A cover letter is not required, but it's recommended in the case of a leasehold condo to explain where Department of Finance can see the that you've satisfied the requirements uh, for a leasehold condo. Um, you're going to uh, provide the corporate documents for the uh, organization. It's it's certificate of incorporation with any amendments. It's bylaws. It's letter from the Internal Revenue Service saying that it qualifies under 501c3, a copy of its 990 tax return. As to the use of the space, you're going to provide a TCO or CFO for the space. If you need to show contemplated use, you're going to provide the documents for that. If you're leasing to another nonprofit, you'll provide the lease and explain that you meet the test. Uh, not making a profit on the lease. Um, and when can you file the application? The day that the declaration is recorded on ACRIS, again, you're going to submit a confirmatory deed, which will be one of the things that you're going to attach to your application. Um, you'll have all the documents at that point. So that's the day you can file it. When is it going to get approved? Um, about a year ago, I would I would usually tell people two months. Right now, it's around four months. Is there anything you could do to speed it up or start get a start before 
the uh, declaration is recorded? Not really. Um, I mean, of course, you can prepare, but you can't. Nobody at the Department of Finance is going to talk to you about it or give you, um, you know, a, some sort of indication that everything is wonderful before before you file. Um, people sometimes ask, should we get a letter ruling? We talked a lot about letter rulings today. Some great letter rulings, like the one on the the homeless shelter, the original letter ruling on leasehold condos the uh, LLC letter ruling. But in the course of this uh, today's talk, we've mentioned almost all the letter rulings that the Department of Finance has ever done in the area of the property tax. They do a lot more for other taxes, but letter rulings in their proper case are great, but they're they're very, you know, very limited to where they're useful because of the fact that they, they're allowed three months to make a decision. In fact, there's not much you can do about it if they take more than that, and sometimes they do. And there's always the possibility they'll tell you something that you don't want to know. Uh, and and you know, you might have been better off not highlighting the issue. So letter rulings have very limited, yeah, are good when if for very specific uses, but gen not in general application. For the most part. You just have to look at the nonprofit's paperwork, make sure it meets all the tests, and put it all together in a nice, neat package with a bow and submit it, you know, one the day after your declaration is recorded, and then wait. There's really nothing else you could do. A few last things um, about um, the property tax, when you have a leasehold condo, there's a few things to think about that may vary from what you would do in a typical office building or even a office building that's been a fee condo before some of the units were transferred to nonprofits. Um, the owner of the building will be filing an income and expense report with the Department of Finance the RPIE that will help the department uh, figure out how much to assess the property for. Um, in a condo, each unit could behave as its own property, or you could agree that the uh, original landlord will control everything and keep filing as if the building were still you know, not a condo. Um, and I'd say that second situation is most common and maybe one that makes most sense for most, in most cases, the um, leasehold condo units that, uh, that are leased, uh, have underlying leases, ground leases to the nonprofit are probably going to have relatively low rent. So when that's blended in with maybe higher rents for for-profit uh, tenants in the same building, it'll help everybody achieve a lower um, tax burden on the building. The nonprofit won't care because they're not paying anything, but it's not hurting them either. So that that's often the suggestion is have the original landlord keep filing, including the units that are now uh, fully exempt. Um, the uh, same issues about assessment appeals, who's going to control them. Often the, the original landlord wants to file for them all together to keep it, keep the assessment low. Um, the nonprofit owner might want to have the right to protest if, in, if its application is denied and it has to appeal. There's an appeal process. Um, so those are some issues to think about. Um, and I think, oh, uh, there was a mention of refunds. Um, there's a re the refunds are uh, retroactive to the date of the declaration being recorded. Um, bear in mind that you now have new lot numbers, so there'll be there may be credits on the new lots. Um, and there may also be credits on the parent lot. And sometimes it takes a little doing to get the Department of Finance to refund 
but the, those uh, parent lot credits, uh, but they do do it eventually. Um, another thing that takes about six weeks or two months to do once you apply, you have to apply for the refund to get it. it doesn't come to you automatically. All right, I think that's. Uh, I think Stuart, you're supposed to say something right now. Uh, well, I Glenn, what, what I'm going to say is a question for you and Bob before we give the uh, the CLE credit, and and that is, um, have what's your experience been with rejections by DOF on applications for the tax exemption, either initially or in subsequent years, and and what would the reasons have been? Stuart, you're, you're good thing you raise something which I omitted, which is that the nonprofit exemption, there is a requirement for an annual certificate of continuing use or renewal application. And that's an important requirement. It's due by January 5 of every year. Um, and it's, a, it's an online form that basically asks, have you changed anything? But they keep changing the questions, and sometimes they could be trick questions. So actually, I'd say we ha we haven't had that much experience really on denial of initial applications that we prepared and filed. But we have had clients who had exemptions for years, who have somebody in their organization who who fills out these um, renewal applications every year, and sometimes they change something or say something that kicks off uh, an alarm bell at the Department of Finance and they take the exemption away and we, we have to sometimes fight to get get it back. Um, they're, they're, these staff of the Department of Finance are for the most part working in a vacuum. They're just looking at some words on a, on a screen and say, oh, that looks like a change that we have to do something about. Um, so that is something that the client is well advised, first of all, to make sure that somebody is responsible for doing this every year. And when they leave the organization that they hand it off to somebody else uh, and doesn't get neglected. And the other is that, you know, they use a little common sense of what they fill in there. And, you know, when, when it's our client, if they are in doubt about whether they should say something, we'll, we'll help them with the wording. Um, denials for um, initial applications. Mo the only very rare to get a denial on organizational purposes. Uh, most most organizations are cut and dry. Churches, schools, hospitals. Um, you know, if you're in one of the more exotic things, it could be a possibility that Department of Finance has denied some organizations that I thought were political in nature rather than educational, but those are quite unusual. Uh, more common reasons for denial in the initial application have to do with use, um, where there's, there doesn't appear to be any use, or the there's a lease to another group and there's a question about the, whether the rent is too high. Um, on the also, also contemplated use is a hot topic where you have to establish you really do intend ultimately one day to occupy that space for the tax exempt purpose. And there's a three year limit on that basically or a, a three year automatic buy once you prove to satisfy the problem of finance that you are contemplating suitable improvements, they'll give you the exemption for three years, but in the fourth year if you haven't shown that you're actually using it, they'll take the exemption away. And then you have to either, uh, you have to come back and show proof that you really do intend to do the improvements where we're delayed for some reason. Glenn? Yes. Uh, is, is that it? That's it. Okay. I didn't want to cut you off. Uh, let me give the uh, CLE number and then uh, Renee, have some additional comments, and I want to discuss the next two uh, uh, webinars. Uh, this, this, you have to put in the, the form that you can uh, take down from uh, the, the website, 
The, the number for this presentation is HK2307110. Seven four four five, HK twenty three, O seven, one one, seven four four five. I'll leave it up. Uh, Renee, would you like uh, to add some comments? Sure. I first wanted to touch upon something that Glenn said. Um, I'm actually working on a leasehold condo with a public authority downtown. Um, so it can be done. Uh, and the, the hardest thing that we came across was that our structure is different than the 2013 private letter ruling structure. And we had to really explain to them that not every structure has to mirror the 2013 ruling. So once we you know, got, got that point across, uh, the, the negotiation was pretty similar to other negotiations, except that public authorities are not allowed to um, sign power of attorneys and our leasehold condo deck called for a power of attorney. So we had to negotiate around that. So that's just something to consider when you're doing a leasehold condo with a, with a public authority. Um, the second thing is that I think one of the first questions that landlords ask us when we're about to do a leasehold condo is, what is my lender going to say? And is there interest in the in the property you know going to be hurt by this leasehold condo structure and the answer is no because the the lender's interest is in the land and the leasehold condo does not affect the land so the mortgage that the landlord has stays in place um, and from the lender's perspective it's the it's the exact same interest that they had prior to the leasehold condo being formed um, another issue I wanted to raise is when we do these leasehold condos with charter schools, many charter schools get a lot of state funding and there are certain requirements that the charter schools have in terms of what expenses they're um, responsible for. And so we, they have to be responsible you know, for, for real estate taxes and rent and other things. And sometimes the, le the leasehold condo structure kind of hurts that. And so what we, we've we come up with what we like to call a friends of structure, where a related entity of the charter school actually forms the leasehold condo, and we can structure around it so that the charter school doesn't lose state funding and can also obtain the real estate tax exemption. Um, another issue that we've come across, which is new, and Bob, I think we've talked to you about this, where the Department of Finance has decided that we need to, that in order to form a condo, you need to have two units. And so if we do a condo within a condo, the fee condo needs to have three tax lots instead of two, when, because when we form the leasehold condo, one of the fee tax lots disappears. And so the Department of Finance has been dropping the base lot for where, wherever the leasehold condo is formed. Now, in a regular straight leasehold condo, it doesn't really make a difference because you get the two leasehold condo lots. But when you have a condo in a condo, you're left without the fee tax lot. So the Department of Finance slowly but surely started making us change certain things to the point where now they actually really do base drop that, that fee base lot. Um, and so again, that's just another thing that we have to take into consideration and, and structure around. Um, and then lastly, we just had, an, had a deal where we negotiated the deal, we actually signed the ground lease, recorded the memo of lease, and then the deal was put on hold for various reasons just related to the deal. And when we were about to convey the leasehold condo unit to the not-for-profit, we realized that we were under the 30-year term at that point. And so even though the memo of lease had been recorded for 30 years, when we were actually conveying the unit to the not-for-profit, we were at maybe 28 or 29 years. And so before we conveyed it, we had to figure out how to structure around that. And we had to do a memo to the, uh, uh, we had to do an amendment to the memo of lease and to the, to the ground lease. So there's a lot of different specific details that, that come up. And like Aaron and I said, every deal is different. Um, and it, we've sort of had fun kind of structuring around all of these different issues. Thank you, Renee. Renee is absolutely right about the lenders. Um, we we are on a regular basis brought into conversations with the lenders, and once they understand the structure, and once we show them uh, the the uh, org chart and how all the the parts work, they approve the structure. 
because they understand it's beneficial to the property and they're not really at risk. Uh, I, wa I want to thank uh, all of our participants, Renee and Aaron, of course, and Bob and Glenn. But before we sign off, I want to discuss the next two webinars that we're going to be doing, which deal with very important issues that have arisen with regard to the real estate industry. The first has to do with insurance. And as everyone knows, insurance has become very difficult to keep. It's become very expensive. And it would appear as if there's no flexibility whatsoever in getting around these requirements uh, that the insurance companies have set up because they're trying to mitigate risk. What we have found and what we'll talk about in the uh, next webinar will be how to draft around issues that are raised by the insurance company in order to assist you in getting the coverage you need by modifying your documents to reflect a slightly different relationship with the insurance company in the event of a casualty in order to mitigate the exposure that the insurance companies feel they have. Unfortunately, uh, the weather patterns that we've seen having to do with climate change has created a very serious problem in the insurance industry. And I think as an industry, we should look at how we can ameliorate these problems by refining how we describe the role of the insurance company. The, the following month, we're going to do uh, uh, a webinar uh, on using limited partnerships rather than limited liability companies. Um, the, the, as you know, the federal government has enacted a corporate transparency law that requires that basically all entities uh, uh, that uh, are utilized in transactions have to register with the federal government. Uh, it's a burden, but it's not dangerous because the filing with the government is secret and only government, the federal government agencies can get access to the information. Unfortunately, the state of New York in its infinite wisdom has passed a, a law that goes into effect in the fall that will require all limited liability companies in New York to register with the state. And the difference between the federal and the state law is that the, federal, the state law will require public disclosure. Um, we have raised issues with the legislature about identity theft, uh, about creating a disincentive for investors to come into the New York market. But as is, has become typical, there's no interest in the legislature to try to work with the industry to come up with a solution. So instead, it's returning to something that we utilize before the invention of the limited liability company by Wyoming in 1989, and that's the limited partnership. Prior to uh, the, limited, uh, the limited liability companies, uh, we must have formed 200 uh, limited partnerships uh, for investors. And this, the only reason that we stopped doing limited partnerships and went to limited liability companies is that it the law was written in such a way, thank you, Wyoming, uh, which is the, probably the last place in the world you'd expect to see something this creative. Um, it was just easier. And then the, the states all went along and it basically became a simple form to create the limited, uh, the limited liability companies. So I don't think anyone watching this webinar or anybody in the real estate industry believes that it's a good idea or that someone somewhere is going to be protected by limiting the names of the participants in the limited liability company and not making it public disclosure. So we have to we had to come up with a response. Um, I was toying with the idea of, of bringing back land trusts 
but decided the limited partnership was a much better entity. And so we are going to have a program discussing limited partnerships, how they're formed, why they're different than limited liability companies. And uh, by the way, they aren't really, uh, they're just a little bit more complicated. And since they worked so well for uh, hundreds of transactions, uh, there's no reason why not to bring them back. So we will uh, tell you the dates of both uh, of these webinars going forward, but I think you'll agree that they will be very interesting and important. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, the participants uh, and particularly Lauren Faulkner, who, who uh, works with us on putting these webinars together for uh, doing such a professional job and how much I, I enjoy working with the group to getting these things done. Thank you. Have a, have a great rest of July. Stay safe and we'll see you in August.